Some questions that's already been turned in. Uh, uh, why was David called the man after the God's own heart? These are leftover questions from former times. If he had so much sin in his life. Isn't that a great question? Here's David, a man after God's own heart. How on earth could a man who, uh, how many of those 10 commandments did he break? Let's see, he, he committed adultery, he coveted another man's wife, he murdered another man, he uh, dishonored his father and his mother by the life's decision that he made, and he lied and the deceit that, he, that was in there. He broke about half of the commandments in, in a very, very short time. How on earth could this man be a man after God's own heart? Let me, let me tell you the answer to that. If you will contrast King Saul's sin with David's sin. We're not going to look at the verses in there. It's all over there in 1 Samuel. King Saul made two mistakes. You know what, what mistakes he made? Worshiping God. And here's a man out committing adultery and all the other things that's involved in this. King Saul worships God in the wrong way. And David's over here breaking half of the Ten Commandments there in just one short period of his life. Which one of those men's a godly man? See, the first time Saul committed sin because he offered a sacrifice when he was not of the tribe of Levi. He wanted to worship God. And the second time he sinned was whenever instead of killing King Agag, 1 Samuel chapter 15, you remember the, the Lord told him to go kill Agag and all the animals that were there. He brought back the animals to sacrifice to God. And on both occasions, God says, King Saul, I've had it up to here with you. Your family is not going to be the ruling family in this nation. What had he done? Worshiped God in a wrong way. You know the difference? When David was confronted with his sin, David's response was, I have sinned. When King Saul was confronted with his sin, you know what he said? Not me. Samuel, it was your fault. You were not here ready to offer the sacrifice. And the second time, when he was confronted about sparing King Saul and those animals that were to be sacrificed, he said, why is the, what the people wanted to do? He did not own up to his sin. Look at the heart of King Saul rebellious against God and blaming everybody else on this earth for his wrong. David, on the other hand, was an individual who whenever was confronted with his sin said, I have sinned. Folks, what kind of person you want to be? Man after God's own heart, who, who uh, whenever he's done wrong, does everything he can to make it right. That's why he was a man after God's own heart. God loves doing right. Whenever, whenever uh, David did wrong, David recognized it. David said, I'm sorry for what I've done. I'm going to do right. I'm going to do right. King Saul said, well, you may, you may accuse me of doing wrong, but it wasn't my fault. It was, it was Samuel's fault for not being here and the other one also. There's another question here. What does the Bible say about demons? What does the Bible say about demons? You would have, if you would be conscious of uh, how often sometimes the charismatic people, in, uh, individuals uh, uh, talk about demon possession You'd think it's mentioned all the way through the Bible. How many times demon possession mentioned in the Old Testament? Maybe three times. And so here's the first, you know, 39 books of the Old Testament and only two, about three times do you ever find demon possession mentioned over there. One time is even a question mark whenever King Saul had a, a, a spirit of melancholy that came upon him and some have looked at that as demon possession, but it doesn't really look like the demon possession of the first century because David could play the harp and drive that evil spirit away from him. That's not like demon possession when you get to the new demon possession of the New Testament. But there is a verse in the Old Testament. We'll look at it in just a moment, but let's back away before we do that and point out the fact that when you start in Matthew and Mark and Luke and, and occasionally in the book of Acts, there's demon possession all over the New Testament time. It is as though it is non-existent. And when Jesus comes on this earth, there is an abundance of demon possession everywhere they go. When he sent out the 12, cast out demons. When he sent out the 70, cast out demons. Jesus, every place he went, was, uh, uh, came across those uh, that were involved in, in the matter of demon possession. And it was a part of his life and a part of what he was doing in, in relationship to all of this. Now, what is this all about? Let me get you, pick up your Bible, and here's a verse 
that if you don't know where it is, you need to take one of those black back blank pages in the back of your Bibles and write down where this verse is. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, and put a star by, the, by verse 2 because that's the key verse. Here's the verse that explained demon possession more than anything else. Verse 1, prophetically, Zechar- Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, in that day, look at it, in that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. This is messianic. It's the time whenever, you know, there's a fountain filled with blood, the song that we sing about, and that blood is there, and those who are, are cleansed in the blood that flows from Emmanuel's vein, it's, here it is in, in, in prophecy. And there's to be that day, prophetically speaking, you could go back to chapter 12, and it was the time whenever the Holy Spirit would be poured out, chapter 12, verse 10. It was the time, chapter 12, verse 7, whenever they would strike the shepherd and the sheep would be scattered, quoted in Gethsemane in, relation, in relationship to what happened when Jesus was arrested in Gethsemane. What is going to happen in that day? Look at it. Verse 2 says, In that day when the fountain is open for sin and uncleanness, that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land, they'll no longer be remembered, and I also will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to depart out of the land. What's going to happen when Jesus comes? There is to be an end of prophecy. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 tells us, that tongues and knowledge and prophecy will cease. And we understand from the study of that, it ceased whenever that which was perfect came. And thus the statement is that when that fountain is open in that day, I will stop demon possession on this earth. Now let me look at one other verse, and that is whenever they came back in Luke chapter 10, when the 70 came back and said, Lord, even the spirits were subject to us through your name. You got Luke chapter 10, verse 18 through 20. It's amazing. They've been able to go out and uh, uh, do all of these miracles that, that, that the Lord had empowered them to do. But the one miracle they, that came back rejoicing in was, I... Uh, uh, Well, it's verse 17. Lord, even the demons were subject to us through your name. Demon possession was ever. And when they came back, though they they had power over every kind of sickness, the one thing that really impacted them was this matter of the fact we could cast out demons. And they were amazed at it. And Jesus said, and look at the Greek tense, I was seeing Satan fall from heaven like lightning. You know what's happened? It's curtain times for Satan. The time has come whenever Satan, who has been in the very presence of God, his power is about to be limited. Jesus is to proclaim victory over principalities and powers. And he says, when Satan was being bound, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And thus it is that the prophecy in the Old Testament says when Jesus comes, demon possession is going to, going to cease. And when Jesus ascends into heaven and you get into the book of Acts, there's only a couple of occasions in the book of Acts demon possession is ever mentioned again. Isn't that amazing? In the epistles, how often is demon possession mentioned? It's not there. Why? Zechariah chapter 13 verse 2 says, when the fountain is open for sin and uncleanness, there will not be demon possession. We'll go a little bit farther on this. You look like you're interested in this. What about epilepsy? Haven't you ever seen anybody having epileptic fit? And don't you know that that's demon possession? Look at Matthew chapter 4 and the latter verses of Matthew chapter 4. Whenever uh, Jesus is doing all of these things that's happening there, uh, you may have the new King James. The old King James has the word lunatics in here. Somebody start raving crazy. Look in, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 24, uh, and look at it carefully. His fame went throughout all of Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed. What's that? 
all manner of individuals who, who, who were afflicted with various diseases and torments and those who were demon possessed. And then he says, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them all. And so epilepsy is something totally different from demon possession. And this verse has it in two separate categories. If you've got the old King James, it has the word lunatics here. You got exactly the same thing. Sometimes people will say, well, he's, he's crazy, cra crazy as he can be, and therefore he must be demon possessed. Oh, no. Demon possession is listed as one thing. Epilepsy, lunatics, is listed as another thing. That was to cease whenever, Zechariah chapter 13 verse 2 says, when the fountain is open for sin in Jerusalem, demon possession and prophecy will come to an end. And that's exactly what happened. Look in chapter 12. I didn't mean to spend this much time here. Matthew chapter 12. Whenever Jesus is casting out demons, uh, uh, it, it's amazing that G whenever, uh, well, verse 22, they brought to him one who was demon possessed and mute and he healed him so that the blind spake. The multitude says, is this not the son of David? And uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees said, he's doing it by the power of Beelzebub. Jesus said, oh no, I'm not. Satan is not going to fight against Satan. And so here's demon possession associated with the power of Satan. And he says, I, Satan would not cast out Satan because a kingdom divided against itself, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And if Satan is fighting against Satan, Satan's house is going to fall. A house divided against itself is brought to de desolation. Look at that. Satan's house. You see that in, in, in verse 25, every kingdom divided against itself, every city or house divided against itself uh, will not stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, how is he divided against himself? Then he says, I am casting out demons by the power of the Holy Spirit. But look in verse 28 and 20, or 29 and verse 30, whenever he said, else how can one enter a strong man's house except he first bind the strong man. Here's demon possession. Where's it coming from? Coming out of the power of Satan. And Jesus is out there while he's out, before, he, uh, before Satan is destroyed by the coming of Jesus, before he is put, his power is taken from him, before he's bound, Revelation chapter 20, here Jesus is binding the strong man. Why? Well, he's, he's taking the power that Satan has and he's casting out all of these demons. And then Jesus said, and I'm headed into the strong man's house. I'm going into Hades. I'm going to ruin Satan. Revelation chapter one, verse 18, when he comes out of Hades, he says, look what I've got. I have the keys to death and to Hades. That's what demon possession is all about. Guy in New Zealand in a religious discussion says, my little child was demon possessed. And I said, what did he do? Well, he threw the bottle out of, his, out of the crib. Any demon possessed kids in here? Or in, you know, I think I know of at least one who threw his uh, bottle out of the crib. And while he may p p be possessed, he's not demon possessed. Uh, you st and then again, he said, and then he took the scissors and he, and he cut the curtains. How many of you girls ever trimmed your hair when you were a little girl and everything? Demon possession. No, demon possession in Bible times caused, caused people to have superhuman strength. It took over the possession of their bodies and, and, and gave them sometimes sickness and illness, but it did all sorts of crazy things, causing a man to cast himself into the fire. That's demon possession. That's totally different from throwing your bottle out of the crib, you know, when you're, when you're a, you know, a year or so old or something like that. Totally different. How about that? The ne very next card I picked up turned in tonight is, is there still demon possession influence over humans today? Answer is, no, there is no demon possession if Zechariah 13.2 is properly understood. Did prophecy come to an end? Because the Bible said, when that happened, demon possession would pass out of the land. Here it is, unknown, almost unknown in the Old Testament, unknown in the epistles. Where on earth do the demons appear? Right in that brief period of time. And Jesus needed to manifest visibly that he had power over Satan. How did he do it? 
Well, he cast out all of the demons of those that, that were demon possessed that, at, at, that, uh, uh, at that time. And that's exactly the way that he did. In order that he might bind Satan. And so Satan was bound, not that he was destroyed. John chapter 12, verse 30 and 31. David, if you want to put that up there, when Jesus is ready at the very hour of his death, he, he says, the prince of this world is cast out. What's happened? Satan's power is going to be limited. And so Jesus triumphant over principalities and powers, and that includes demon possession. Read that, that expressions again and again. Here's another, another question. What does the Bible say about forgiving? What about forgetting? Uh, well, sometimes, somebody, sometimes we say, well, when you forgive, when uh, you forgive, you got to forget. Um, I don't know if anyone do that except, self, self hypno, except hypnosis, do you? You know, maybe, they, maybe you go get shock treatment down at the psychiatric ward and, and that would uh, make you forget about what's happening. You can't forget what's happened in your life. Here's what, here's what is involved in forgiveness. It is a change of attitude. Look in, in uh, wow, is that Luke 17 that says, if your brother sins against you seven times in a day, David, you, you'll have to find the verse if it's not 17. It's on the right-hand side of the page. And yes, it's chapter, Luke chapter 17, lower right-hand side of the page, uh, uh, page number 921. Anyway, <laughs> Jesus says in verse one, it is impossible that no offenses, or it is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to those through whom they come. Be better for him a millstone hung around his neck and was thrown into the sea that it should not offend one of these. And then he says, now take heed to yourself. If your brother sins against you, here's the principle of forgiveness. Somebody has done you wrong. If your brother sins against you, Rebuke him. Then he says, and if he repents, forgive him. I want you to understand that we need to love the soul of that brother as much after he has wronged us as much as we love the soul of that brother before he wronged us. And we need to long to have that brother in heaven with us as much after he's wronged us as we did before he did us wrong. But there is a concept that says that I have to forgive him, I have to forgive him even if he's done me wrong. And I think what we're doing is we're confusing the tenderness of heart that we had before him and that same tenderness of heart that we had after he's done us wrong. We're confusing the desire that we have for that man to go to heaven that we had before he wronged us and, 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 uh, and, and with the attitude of, of, of desire for him to go to heaven. That never does change. Can I show you godly attitudes? Look in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, there are some souls, chapter 6, there are some souls that are under the altar, starting in verse 9 and going, going through verse 11. Here are some people that have been wronged. There are souls that have been beheaded in this book that's figurative. And he says, they had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony. They're martyrs. They've been done wrong. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on them that, that, uh, who dwell on the earth. I want you to look at that. They've been done wrong. They've been beheaded. They've been taken away from their family. They've been taken away from the church. They've been taken away and their life has been brought to an end. What is the attitude that they have? Well, you just got to forgive them and, and forget it. Oh, no. They haven't repented. They haven't repented. And so the statement is, white robes were given unto them and it was said to them that they should rest a little longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were. Look at verse 10. Holy, or how long, O Lord, 
holy and true, do you not judge and avenge them that's done, me, done us wrong on this earth? You've got to understand. Has God forgiven these martyrs? Has God forgiven these martyrs? Why hasn't He forgiven them? Well, it's obvious. Does God long for them to go to heaven? Is God going to be kind toward them? Is God going to treat them right? Absolutely. But they have sinned. And God does not forgive unless there is repentance. And you've got to understand that. That sometimes we confuse having a godly attitude means that if someone's done you wrong, you, you, you know, it, 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 you, you, just can't, you just can't be mindful of that. Well, Luke 17 says, if he repents, forgive him. If I forgive him before he repents, have I done what God said? If seven times in a day a brother does me wrong, and if seven times in a day he repents, if I forgive him before he repents, have I done what the Lord says? I mean, just look at the verse. What's the verse say? If he repents, forgive him. Now then, what needs to be my attitude toward him? I need to treat him right. I need to turn the other cheek. I need to, to treat him as though he were, he were a marvelous, you know, a, 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 as though uh, he's a creature loved by God. Is God going to love him? Yes. Is God going to treat him right? Yes. But he's not forgiven until there is repentance. And that's what we, what we really need to understand. Let me show you the attitude of a man after God's own heart in relationship to this. We've, we've dealt with this before, but let's look at it again. In Psalms 35, starting in verse 1, David, you can put the first, uh, well, put the first five or six verses, however I mean you can get on the screen up there. Plead my cause, O God, O Lord. Here's a man after God's own heart. Here is, here is a godly heart in a human body, and here's the words coming out of the heart of a godly heart in a human body. What does he say? Plead my cause, O Lord, with those who strive with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for my help. Uh, take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for my help. Draw out the spear and stop those who pursue me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Let them be put to shame and brought to dishonor who seek my life. Somebody's done David wrong. What's he doing? He's pleading to the God of heaven, God, stand up for me. Isn't that what those souls on the altar were doing? Those who'd been beheaded? How much longer, Lord, is it before we bring judgment and bring, bring rightness on this earth? And David looks to the God of heaven and says, plead my cause. Let them be put to shame. Let them be turned back and brought to confusion who plot my hurt. Let them be like chaff before the wind and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery and let the angel of the Lord pursue them. Here's the heart of a godly man who's been done wrong. What is he doing with the, with the wrong that he feels. He releases it and gives it back to God. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. You know what follows that? Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. What's to be my attitude toward that individual who has done me wrong? Same attitude I'd had if he hadn't done me wrong. If he's hungry, I'm going to take care of him. On a one-on-one, -on -one, you're still in, in, in Psalms, uh, Psalms 35. Look, look, um, look in verse 12 and 13. They rewarded me evil for good to the sorrow of my soul. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting and my prayer would return to my own heart. I paced about as though he were my friend or my brother. What is David's attitude toward that individual? He's, he's going to treat him in a godly way. What's he going to do with the, with the injustice that he suffered? 
not his problem. Why? Vengeance is mine, I will repay. Look in Romans 12, and that, that's where that verse is. When, when uh, there were those Christians, and by the way, it's possible that some of those addressed in the book of Romans became martyrs, and they're pictured in the book of Revelation. They were right in the heart of where the persecution that was coming from Rome. And perhaps some of those individuals who received this very Roman letter were individuals who are depicted in the book of Revelation crying out, Lord, how much longer is it going to be? And so he says, uh, verse 17, Romans 12, 17, repay no one evil for evil. Somebody done you wrong, what do you do? You don't repay them evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it's possible, as much as lies within you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourself. What should be my attitude? Not an attitude of vengeance. Not an attitude of vengeance at all. But rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. What about forgetting, forgetting it? Well, the hurt will always be there. But the attitude of mind of how I treat that individual never changes. Why? I act toward him like he's my friend or my brother. But sometimes individuals uh, say, well, you know, if somebody does you wrong, even if they don't forget, even if they don't repent, you don't have to forgive them. That is not what Luke 17 says. It doesn't mean that I hold a grudge against them. I feel with anger and bitterness toward them and, you know, and I'm holding it against them, this thing that they've done. Oh, no. But we've misunderstood what forgiveness is all about. Uh, here's another one, probably based on some comments we made in another lesson. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. The last days, and 2 Peter 3, 3 helps show passages, the last days mentioned in the Bible come to fruition in New Testament times. The word is complete in last days and does not relate to our present time of the coming of Christ to, uh, to, to this earth. No question on that, just a comment. Uh, you want to look at Hebrews, and so ask questions. Don't make comments. I'm preaching tonight, not you. Look in, look in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. <laughs> I say that jokingly, I'm not, not, that, not by way of rebuke, but uh, it helps if it's in a question form. I know, I know where you want us to go with that. God who at sundry times, Hebrews chapter 1, pardon me, verse 1, verse 1 and 2. God who at sundry times and in various manners spake in times past to the fathers, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. What's that mean? Well, it does not mean that the expression last days refers to the period right before Jesus comes back. You talk to religious friends, they'll say, you think we're living in the last days? Well, Jesus lived during the last days. You know what this verse says? Look at it, what it says. God in these last days has spoken to us through Jesus. Now, after he had spoken to us through Jesus, what happened? who being the brightness of His glory, the express image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus lived during the last days. And so the question indicates, well, what about these passages that, that, that talk about uh, the last days and everything? We've got to understand that the, the expression the last days is not used in the Bible to refer to the days right before Jesus comes back. How do I know? Because Jesus lived during the last days. That is what this verse says, right? God in old times spoke through men, through the prophets in various ways and various times, but God in these last days has spoken unto us by His Son. Now, look in chapter 2 because there's a continuation of thought in chapter 2. Whenever, starting in verse 3 and 4, he says, How shall we escape so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by those that heard him? Jesus spoke in the last days. But what about those who heard Jesus? Did they live in the last days? Yes. 
Look in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, there's a quotation of a verse in the Old Testament that says, It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That's Acts chapter 2, verse, uh, verse 16 and 17. Verse 17 looks back to Joel the prophet, you know, seven or 800 years before Jesus ever came. And Joel the prophet says, in the last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Now mark it, the charismatic movement in our society, the Pentecostal uh, uh, movement in our society says, why the abundance of tongue speaking and all of these things is proof that the world's about ready to end and Jesus is about ready to come back. How do you know? Because God said in the last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit and there'll be wonders and signs and all of these other things. What was Joel talking about? Was Joel talking about the, was he talking about the, uh, 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 the, the, the 21st century? Look at, verse, look at verse 16. This is what Joel was talking about. Well, what's, he, what's the discussion? These men are drunk. Peter stands up, well, these men are not drunk as you suppose, seeing it's but the third hour of the day. But what you are seeing, tongues of fire and us speaking in all of these languages, is, is what Joel was talking about when Joel says, in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. When's that? Not the 21st century, listen, not the 21st century, but the first century. Not the 21st century, but the first century. One other question that's here, and it fits right in with this, and we'll go to that and then we'll stop. There is that idea that because of the, all of the prevalence, at least so-called prevalence of, of tongue possession and the speaking in tongues that the Pentecostal movement claims to have, and by the way, Study the Bible and you'll recognize they are not duplicating what was there in the first century. In the first century, languages were languages that people understood. They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave, Spirit gave them utterance. And the people who heard them said, how are we hearing these men who've not studied how are we hearing them speaking languages that we have understood since our birth? It was not just gobbledygook and making of noise and sounds. I've got a little booklet, had one, I think I still have it, that says, if you want to speak in tongues, then just bow and just get in a very reverent thing and then start making utterances. And whatever God gives you, just start making those noises because God is trying to use your tongue to speak in tongues. You know, you can get a little child to speak in tongues. You know, uh, uh, Josiah, I bet you can speak in tongues, not just Spanish. But Josiah's got the kind of personality that if I said, Josiah, got any Chinese friends? And Josiah might say, yeah, down in Paraguay, I got some Chinese friends. How do they talk? Ching long, ching long, ching long, ching long, dong, ching long, ching. Uh, Vivian, you got any friends down, down in, in Paraguay? Got any German friends? What do they say? <laughs> All I'm doing is making sounds. And, and if you're not shy, you can do it. When you're in the car by yourself, just go ahead and start speaking German and start pe speaking Chinese. And if you don't know how to speak Chinese, here's the way you do it. You go into the kitchen, get all the pots and pans, and you throw them up in the air, and whenever they hit the floor, they go ding, long, ching, long, ching, ding, ding. And so then you can speak Chinese. I'm, I'm not trying to mock what I'm, I'm just trying to give you an understanding that children can speak in tongues. If, 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 but we can't do it because we're too shy. But you can do it just when nobody's around. Try that in and of itself. Um, you know, and, 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 the, and, and the worrisome thing is, people are misusing Joel chapter 2 that says that when the, Joel said, I will pour out my spirit on all the flesh, that's talking about 2011, 2010, 2011, 2012, and 2013. You better get ready. Jesus is coming back because we're living in the last days. 
Jesus lived on this earth and preached on this earth in the last days. That's what Hebrews 1 says. And those that heard him confirmed the words that he spoke, he spoke unto us, and they lived in the last days. How do I know? Joel 2 says it. Acts 2.17 says that this is what Joel was talking about. And if somebody tries to use Joel 2, you just need to pick up your sword and ask them to read Acts 2, the verse 16 and 17, and ask them what Peter said Joel was talking about. That's using the sword to use it to hopefully cut them to the heart. I'll just save this other question. It's about the thousand year reign of Christ. And I can't talk about a thousand years in three minutes. You know me better than that. Isn't it great? Don't you enjoy first, first Sunday nights answering questions? I, I love it because I find out what you're thinking about. I find out what you're dealing with in your life. And uh, 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 here, here's another question. What's saved always say? Why do, you, why, why do people say that? We can talk about those two maybe the next time we answer you know, questions and answers and deal with these kinds of things. The scripture reading tonight, Samuel, Samuel, Samuel thought Eli calling me. No, wasn't, wasn't Eli calling you. Three times he goes to, to his mentor, Eli, and finally Eli says, Samuel, if you, want, if you want to respond to this, you need to say, speak, Lord, I'm ready to listen. And folks, when it comes to answering Bible questions, speak, Lord, speak, Lord, I'm ready to listen. And there's not a thing that we believe we ought to have got to give up in a heartbeat if it's what this book says. But every answer we give, and hopefully we try to do it on these first Sunday nights, is this is what the Bible says. And that's why I've said several times, what does this verse say? Doesn't take a college education. Read a verse and find out what it says in relationship to it. Where are you tonight? Do you want to become a Christian? Do you, are you ready to, to make that step that your faith in the Lord and in the fact that this book is His guide to you and tells you what you need to do in order to go to heaven? That's what a song of invitation is all about. You know, the, the question is, where could I go but to the Lord? You're not going to find the answer anywhere else other than say, Lord, tell me what you want me to do to be saved. And he'll say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Repent for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. Confession is made unto salvation, Romans chapter 10 and verse 10. And be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. That's what he wants you to do. Believing, make up your mind, repent, say, I'm going to follow him. And when you've confessed your faith, you can be baptized. And then you know what he says, I'll forgive you, I'll add you to the family of God. Here's what I want you to do. Every member at Palm Beach Lakes, speak, Lord, tell me what you want me to do. Be thou full of faith, faithful, and I will give you the crown of life. And he didn't lie when he said it because he cannot lie. If you're not saved tonight, how can we help you be saved? Won't you let it be known by coming to the front right now as together we stand and sing. Will you come?